Hey everyone! Welcome back to the Flesh Tools series for SideFX's Project Grot. In the previous chapter, we added vertex colors to our geometry that will be used as masks by our shader in Unreal Engine, kind of like smart materials. In this chapter, we will turn our tool into an HDA and bring it into Unreal to add some set dressing to our scene. Let's get into Houdini! Alright, here we are again. We have our flesh clusters, um, all nicely prepared with all the vertex color data we need. And all that's left to do is to now take all these scattered nodes with all their individual parameters and settings and to unify it under a very simple user interface. And then we can bring it into Unreal. If you're not familiar with how to make HDAs and how to install Houdini Engine and all that stuff, make sure to check out my last video from the Ruins tutorial series where I go into it a bit more in detail. In this chapter, I will skip that part. So to turn our graph into an HDA, I'm just gonna select the nodes that I want and turn them into a subnet. We can press escape to bypass the cooking process. And then I'm gonna take my subnet and press right click create digital asset and I'm gonna call it grot flesh clusters and I'm gonna put it into the grot submenu remove my name and because it's such a sick upgrade I'm gonna turn it into a 2.0 and press create I'm just gonna get a handful of parameters that I think will be useful for instance a seed is always useful a flesh density slider Flash maximum distance, muscle tension, rock scale, thickness, and our material inputs. And of course we should set some default values that make sense. I want a lot of these parameters such as density or muscle tension or rock scale. I want these to be a 0 to 1 range. And in general I'm just gonna choose something in the middle. Okay, so we have some good presets. So now to make my life easier, I'm just going to get a new floating panel and change it to a parameter and just pin the HDA, go in there. So for the rocks, for instance, we can just copy that and multiply that. For the random seeds, I can just go to all the relative places. So the randomizers, for instance, I'm not gonna touch the rocks because they take very long to cook, but I think it's okay if they just cook once in the beginning and then we just leave them alone. Um, but yeah, but for the scatter, definitely I wanna be able to change that on the fly. Yeah, I think that's all we have to randomize really. Then for the maximum distance, we can just go to our ray node because it has this max distance parameter. Just paste that in there. For the flesh thickness, I'm just gonna go to the sweep node and um, I like the value we have right now as a default so um, I'm just gonna allow the user to go uh, twice as much but I'm gonna multiply it with our 0 0.5 so if they want to they can go lower or higher but the default is what we had earlier. For the flesh density, I'm going to go to the scatter node. And what I'm going to do there is I'm basically going to look what feels right. So how far can I go until it looks weird? I don't know. I think something up until like, let's say 2000, maybe. I think this should be the maximum that we allow someone uh, to set. And so I'm going to say 2000 multiplied by our flesh density. So, you know, if they want to, they can go that far, but not farther, and have this range to play with. For the flesh and the concrete materials, is exactly the same as we did it in the Ruin series, where we just get the Unreal Material node, and um, if we just pass our string parameter, um, in Unreal we can just drag and drop our material instance into this parameter, and Unreal will recognize that it should place the material on the flesh. And so I'm gonna do the same for the concrete. So let's see, it should be it should be this. So I'm just gonna drop that here. And I'm just gonna go copy, paste. And one thing I am noticing is that I still have the collision geometry in our output. And of course we don't want that, right? We just want our flesh and our pieces. Okay. 
So basically we have all the parameters set up now. We have our seed, we have our density, we have the maximum distance, rock scale, uh, flesh thickness, we have our materials. The only thing that's left to do is the muscle tension. And this one is the weirdest one to set up, because what is muscle tension, right? Muscle tension is defined by the time that is passing. So each frame our solver is iterating over the system we set up. But how can we expose this timeline as a parameter that someone can manipulate at any given moment? There exists a node that can help us with that called time shift. And what it does basically is it can jump forward in time based on the frame number that we supply. So if I delete this channel and so let's just reset this on our timeline, we are on frame one. I reset the simulation. However, on our time shift, we're on frame um, 30. And if I now click on my time shift, we can see it jumps forward in time. So what I could do, for instance, is I could choose a viable maximum uh, amount, such as, I don't know, 30 or maybe 50. No, I think 30 was pretty good. Okay, so we have 30 as our maximum. And if I now take this muscle tension parameter and go copy, and then we multiply it with that, something kind of unexpected happens, and that is it's not really doing anything. So what's going on? Well, the funny thing is, if I go all the way back to zero, suddenly uh, it, it updates, and then I can go forward in time, but I can't go backwards. And that has to do with the way that our solver works. So what we would have to do to make this a nice and interactive uh, parameter where we could go back and forth as we see fit is that, well, we would have to press reset simulation and then it would update. So if I go back with my slider and I press reset simulation, now we're, we went back in time. And if I go forward, well, that's gonna work. But again, if I wanna go back, I have to press the button. So is there a way that we could maybe automate this? Well. Based on the phrasing of my question, you can probably imagine that yes, there is a way. And the answer to that is Python. And it's actually really easy to do. So if we go to our type properties window and we go to our muscle tension parameter, we can see that there is this callback script parameter here. And what we can do with that is we can write a tiny piece of Python in here. Usually the way that you would use this is that in this callback script, you trigger a different script. For instance, in our script section, we can add a bunch of different scripts. And if we want to, we can trigger it here. But in my case, I really just want to trigger one line of Python code. So this text field should be enough. So how do we trigger this? The way that we can tell Python to press a button is that first we have to tell Python the location of the node where we want to press that button and then give it the name of the button. And then we can use a function to, well, press that button. Let's start by finding the node. So one thing that you should be aware of is that when you want to specify a given location of a node, you have to be aware that this callback script is located on the top level of our HDA. So in the same way that I have to double click and jump inside uh, my HDA to locate my solver one node, I have to tell the script that it has to do the same. So the first step that we have to do is to say who.node and open some brackets. And in here we make some quotation marks and then we say dot slash, which tells Python to dive in to our HDA. And then I just have to specify the name of the node, which is solver1. On this solver1 node, we want to access this button here. And if I hover over it, we can see that the name that Python recognizes is called resimulate. So I now type dot parm and then say resimulate. And then to press the button, you might have guessed it, it's dot press button. And then we have to add these brackets here because it's a Python function. Okay, so now we can just press accept. And so to test our parameter, if I go forward, it's tensing up as expected. But if I go back now, you can see that it's relaxing again. So basically what we've done now is that um, we have told Houdini that every time we make a change to this parameter, it should spam this reset simulation button. It's maybe not the most elegant solution, but it works. All right, so now we have our HDA prepared. Maybe one last cool thing that I wanna show you is that over here in the input output section, 
you can see that our inputs and outputs have these not so informative names. So what we could do is we could give them some more descriptive names uh, that can give our users some information. But apart from just giving it more descriptive names, what we can do is by using certain keywords, Unreal Engine will recognize that we are looking for a specific type of input. So if I were to call this curve input, Unreal Engine will recognize the word curve and then it will default to a curve input right from the get-go. And the same goes for a world input as well. All right, so now I'm just gonna press accept, close this, save my tool, and let's get over to Unreal. All right, so here we are in our Project Grot scene that we have been working on so far. And um, here's our ruins. And as I mentioned at the end of the ruins tutorial series, the ruins themselves already look really cool but I feel like they're missing some set dressing. And this is exactly where our tool comes in, especially for these parts right here, where a lot of the rocks have been eaten away. It would be really cool to have some floating rock pieces with flesh that is growing all over the scene. So let's get our tool into the scene. I'm just gonna open up my content browser and get my tool. And I'm just gonna drag it into the scene. And the first setup should take a bit longer than uh, all the cooks thereafter. Um, but it's not that bad. Okay, so here we have our tool and we can see our rocks. What you can notice if I click on them is that we have this nice little curve. And that is exactly what I just mentioned. So if we go down here, we can now see that we do in fact have a curve input and a world input. So it's just like a neat little trick to make our lives easier. So to control these curves, we can just click on the vertices and then move them around. And if we want to add more points, we can hold the Alt or Option key and then drag. And then we're adding a new piece. And what we can see is that the ray casting against the rocks um, is working just fine. So even without any inputs, it's already making these interesting flesh connections. But of course, what we would like is the rocks to connect to the environment. And to get that, all we have to do is just to go over to our world input and then start selecting what we want to be affected. So of course, the ruins and maybe some surrounding rocks as well. Um, maybe these rockified people. Well, we have to be careful how much we add because of course, anything that we add is gonna add to the loading times. But um, let's see, I think this should be fine. All right, nice. This is much better. And so if we notice, for instance, that here we have some, some intersections happening, that's not a problem. We just forgot to add this model. So we can just go back here where it says start selection and just hold the shift key and just add this rock to it and just run it again. And now we can see that our rock has been included. Before I start dressing the scene with this, I would like to add some materials to it so we don't have these, these intense colors here. Um, so I'm going to go to my materials section, get the concrete. Nice. And we can see that um, we have this little edge wear on uh, uh, where our curvature is and where we have the insides uh, we also have a darker concrete than on the outside and now for the flesh i'm gonna go and get the flesh material oh yes all right so now let's get to work so as i said i want these rocks to be somewhere near the structure to give this feeling like they're just about to fall off but the flesh this I don't know what it is the demonic energy or something is keeping them there keeping them from falling off um, and um, I think I want to make them a little bit bigger so let's see let's go to our parameters this is why it's a good idea to have parameters for certain things like scale because you're never sure how exactly it's going to turn out until well until you see it on the real thing for the other pieces i'm going to move one over here i think it's pretty amazing how fast the calculation speed is i mean it's ridiculous the amount of detail is ridiculous and there's a simulation running in the background there's so much going on 
Uh, but it's still, I mean, like, this is still, I'm, I'm, this is real time right now. I mean, you can see how fast this is happening. Okay, and then I'm gonna put one over here in the corner. Okay, ooh. Now we can maybe play with the random C to see. Let me just close this. Nice, 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 nice. Actually, I wanna, I wanna place this one maybe over here. And that's the cool thing about procedural tools such as this. It makes it really easy to experiment even when you're dealing with highly detailed geometry such as this. And I can just jump to any rock that I like and hold the Alt key and get another rock in there. If we feel like it's a bit too much flesh, we can lower down the density a bit. It's just so nice to play with this tool. I think we already have something really cool here, but of course it's up to the environment artist at the end of the day to decide to decide the final result. Um, I'm just I'm just testing my tool right here. Um, but yeah, I think you know just to play around with some more settings, we can see we can see that we can get some incredible variation going just by changing a few slides. Actually, this looks really cool. I like this. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this one. That's what I love about this tool. It's so playful and it's so nice to let yourself be surprised by what our system came up with, right? And um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna save this now. And here we have our flesh clusters in the scene. It really makes such a huge difference, but there's one last thing that's missing. It would be really cool to have just some standalone flesh. Not flesh part of the ruins, not the flesh clusters, just a standalone layer of flesh that is kind of starting to grow over stuff. And that's what we're gonna do in the next and final chapter, where I'm gonna show how we can take the existing tech that we have, the flesh tech from the ruins, combined with our flesh clusters, and make a new tool out of that to polish our scene. Alright, see you in the next one. Bye-bye!